Good morning. Do you guys have a good night's sleep and ready to rumble again? <laughs> dark in my room. Let me see if I can turn the lights. so much better. <laughs> it's the light behind my back. I'm sorry. better <laughs> sorry it's too too bright behind me i'm trying to adjust the light so you can see my face <clears throat> did everyone have their coffee and breakfast not yet <laughs> Renette, I can hear it in your voice that you didn't. <laughs> not yet. I, I'm not a weekend early morning person. Not a weekend warrior, right? Yeah, I <laughs> no, know. I, I no. shall try to, um, I'm trying not to get um, into too many week weekends for us, but there are some of these topics that are really large and they gave us only so much time and I really don't want you guys to miss on some of this information. No, that's then, okay. That's okay. Yeah. So, and then when we get into uh, your presentations too, because that wasn't also listed in um, for, to allocate the time during the classes. So we had to book it in on weekends. So, he, that's going to be you guys in the center stage on Saturday morning, and I'll be sipping my coffee and listening. So Leonard sent us uh, our recording already from yesterday. So let's just wait for him to uh, join us this morning and then we can um, start. I'm not sure where he is. I'm texting. Good morning, good morning. <laughs> I 
Thanks for letting us know, Sharon. I don't think there's going to be anything um, repulsive in, in, in our session today. <laughs> But we are in infection control, so everything goes. So is it gloomy down in, in BC? Is that where, where we are hearing this sad weather report from? <laughs> Oh, Windsor. It will get better. It always gets better. Yes, I, I like going out to the St. Catharines area. Um, we end up often going there for the um, the wineries at the um, at the bench. And it's always a nice weather there whenever we end up going, but um, no wineries yet. So. Hello, hello. Not sure what is um with Leonard. He's um not responding to me and okay. Um hmm. what I'm gonna do here. Oh, he's having trouble signing in. Um, So um, Leonard is saying he's experiencing some technical difficulties signing in. So let's just give him a few more minutes so he can record our class properly. Um, because I don't want us to lose on the recording either. So let's give him a few more minutes. I think it's all the diseases we gave him last night. Um, 
<laughs> he's slowing him down. He's saying his uh, system froze and he's restarting. So let's give him a few more minutes to an opportunity to come back. Um, I'm sorry for this. It's every every time we get together, it's one thing or the other with us. Um, but yeah, let's give him give him a couple more minutes. Did you guys uh, have an opportunity to think about the yesterday's class? Was there anything you would like us to revisit and um, maybe chant while we are waiting for Leonard to join us? <laughs> I know. <laughs> After everything we gave him, all the diseases, he's like, they are for me. <laughs> okay. Um, <clears throat> so um, I am posting information on our discussion board. So I know many of you will be familiar with information that is there, but um, for you guys that are new and entering novice into the field, I think a lot of this information may be overwhelming. So take your time reading and you will see that there is different agencies that are producing very similar documents and addressing um, similar topics and what are the topics of our interest. Um, sometimes you will see that they're um, looking at the same organism or the same disease from a different perspective. So some will focus more on patients, others will focus on, on the, um, the healthcare workers themselves. And um, so for us working in the field, it's important that we are aware that there is different documents that speak about the same problem. So at times you will have to look up what are the recommendations for the staff? Not necessarily oh. that we do follow up. Well, good morning, Leonard. <laughs> good morning. <laughs> Welcome. Oh. Yeah, once. <laughs> One system pros and the other one, uh, uh, well, just got it uh, uh, able to get it connected now. So Awesome. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining yeah. us. We were worried that we gave you way too many diseases yesterday. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Strangely, none of them were viral, actually, to come to think of it. Oh, no, we gave you COVID, I think, in the end, did we? Um, so <laughs> no, no, no Ebola. Oh, we gave you Ebola. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Good morning. Good morning. All yeah. right. So, uh, are we recording, Leonard? Can we start with a class? Yeah, it's recording. Okay. Perfect. All Thanks. right. So, thank you for joining us, and thank you everyone for this joining this lovely Saturday morning. Yesterday, we covered the healthcare associated infections and some of the community associated that do get imported into our facilities. And then, as of today, we were going to continue with routine practices and additional precautions. Um, so, it is bread and butter of everything we do in a day is setting up it's almost like setting up rules and maybe having your little box that you're operating within it is our routine practices and additional precautions you will find that when you read um apic book they're talking about standard practices it is the same thing it's just a different terminology that we use here in canada and then your additional precautions, you will find that there is going to be sometimes minor differences in terms of the additional precautions. For most part, it's going to be very similar. If there is something that is different, I will highlight that for you. <laughs> so, um, when we start looking into the documents that are issued to us and that we follow in infection control, in particular here in Ontario, we stick with Public Health Ontario documents and they have your routine practices and additional precautions. And then under um, the umbrella of that document, there is three additional uh, appendices that we follow really closely when it comes to your um, respiratory illness management and um, air rows and C. Diff. 
that said and i know we had a brief touch on this it is best practice document it is not operating under any legislation so it is um, defined as those would be the gold standards in the industry and often for us as practitioners it becomes really challenging to defend some of these best practices when it comes to play, when we are in a place where um, there is resistance from the from the upper management or from the unit management and the argument is this is the ideal world we don't always live in the ideal world then we can't always meet all the best practices. The truth is that it is in everybody's interest that we are striving for the gold standard and sometimes recognizing that it's not necessarily what we all can achieve, but if we meet somewhere in between that gold standard and where we are and, and, and strive for it, we will do much better than not actually even considering working in, in improvement areas. So when you start looking into your routine practices, what is important to set um, very clear standard in um, when you're teaching your colleagues that are frontline, doesn't matter if they're nursing, it could be also your maintenance team or your housekeeping team, it is to drive home the message that this is routine and we should all be doing it all the time in all interactions regardless of whether there is additional precautions or is there any concerns is there an outbreak going on on the unit so this would be your basic the minimum that we all have to follow so when you start looking into the breakdown of your routine practices you're looking at routine practices for of course for patients and for visitors and something that um, i feel uh, very often is misunderstood is that risk assessment and then the other big part of it which also kind of involved in a program itself and it's I often find it kind of to the side living on its own large profile is a hand hygiene and um, very often us as practitioners completely pass that program to um, somebody that is interested. I've had entire teams that are not part or hired by IPAC leading the hand hygiene program and doing an amazing job with it. Uh, in smaller facilities, it does fall under IPAC to um, develop and create and push through, but um, when it comes to observations and auditing, it is it is quite cumbersome and time consuming for a practitioner to do that. So every time you have an opportunity to grow a team, by all means, invest some time. It, it is paying back amazingly when you have um, an, an, oh, sorry, Jagdeep. Oh, you can hear me. Can everyone hear me? <laughs> it's always somebody that loses the connection. So I, I don't really know what, what happens. I think it's just a fluke. So let's keep going. And if you guys have trouble, just text, send a text in and we'll monitor. So the next part of your routine practices, of course, is your PPE and personal protective equipment, right? And then when it comes to control of environment, that comes more of a technical part. And it does include some of your maintenance a team to be involved. Your administrative controls include some policies and procedures and support from the senior leadership. And then, um, of course, you have to um, be pushing your routine practices through on your day-to-day -day, um, engagement with your staff. So what, the, what are the elements? So when you start looking into your routine practices, I kind of always imagine it as, as a wheel that is constantly interlocking with each other and in, in a moving motion. I just never see it stagnant or, or um, 
not moving in any direction. So it is just how I imagine things. I don't know that anyone wants to be in my head all the time, or sometimes I don't want to be in my head either, but that's how I imagine things. It is um, including a big piece is that risk assessment that um, we teach to anybody that is having any interaction with either patient or patient environment to look at what are the risks for me engaging into this activity and how do I protect myself? So I already mentioned your hand hygiene program and it is always um, in, in relation to the your four moments of hand hygiene. When you look from the... Um, the World Health Organization, and uh, they are talking about five moments. Down in Australia, they have six moments. It all revolves about the same principle. So it's in here in Canada, in Ontario, uh, we are breaking it down to four moments. It is your initial contact with patient or patient environment, before a septic procedure, after a risk of exposure to blood and body fluids and after the contact with the patient or patient environment. Also important is that play, appropriate patient placement. So we were talking yesterday about putting your patients in additional precautions in private rooms whenever possible. However, there is gonna be times, and there are times more often than not that we are struggling with that, finding that private space. So we start looking into cohorting and finding alternative spaces. Another critical piece of what is routine and should be happening routinely is cleaning of that environment that is occupied by patients and where we work as, as the healthcare providers and staff of the healthcare facilities. Once you break it down to engineering controls, we mentioned briefly yesterday is um, when you start looking into your HVAC system and Marina was saying they have created 40 new rooms in their hospital. So that would be your engineering controls to manage um, the air that is uh, in the patient's room that may have a, an infectious disease that is transmitted via uh, droplets or aerosol um, pr production. So the next thing would be introduction of plexiglass. And uh, quite commonly, you will find it now anywhere you go um, that there is some sort of a divider, even in places like grocery stores and such. Um, after we had the major holdover um, in anticipation of Ebola, the recommendations came from the ministry to install um, a dividers and separations for all the um, staff facing external visitors. So anyone who was coming through triage or anyone who was coming through registration or um, clinics in your hospitals where you have patients that are coming from outside, were supposed to be provided with the plexiglass. And because of the cost and, and the work that does go in, some hospitals have done more than the others, of course, but even for the ones that have been doing amazing work, they what they did was the stratification of the risk and reviewing where would be your highest risk for staff exposure. So that's how they started installing these barriers. And um, of course, because Ebola was so long ago, we start forgetting about things and priorities do change in the day-to-day -day operation. Some of these never got actually finalized. So now with COVID, it has brought up a number of clinics in your facilities that have not been completed. So you will see that a lot of these um, installations were taking place when COVID took center scene this past two years. Uh, also, you're looking at disposal of the sharps and uh, the safety disposal sharp containers. They come in different colors and shapes, but most likely you will find them and they should be at a point of care and easily accessible for everyone to use. And then, of course, the administrative controls, those are your policies and procedures. There is mandatory education from us, but also other departments are getting involved with 
training the frontline staff. Then we are go talking about immunization of our, our uh, frontline staff. There is a lot of discussion going on with COVID, but um, there is other immunizations that are mandatory for frontline staff to, to be fully vaccinated. Some of the things that I can think of is tetanus, polio, measles, chickenpox, and so on and so forth. And of course, teaching staff the respiratory etiquette. And what is really important here is, I, um, is teaching staff to stay at home when sick. So I think that's that's one of the obstacles for us in in uh, healthcare to uh, encourage that behavior. And there is many reasons why is there a problem with um, enforcing that. So it is also frowned upon when you just pull out a shift from your colleague and you say, I'm sick, I'm not coming to work. But there is also um, some hospitals have been putting their staff on um, on a, a program where you have somebody who is coming sick or not coming sick, rather calling sick. So there is a lot of pressures around producing um, the doctor's notes and so on and so forth, which discourages people from actually taking that time when they're truly sick and they're coming to work sick and creating more problems for themselves and for the, for the patients. All right. So part of our training and expectation from the facilities that we work is also to train and educate our visitors. So besides the fact that we are training and educating our frontline staff, it is an expectation to educate our visitors. So more so you will find that we as IPAC get involved with one-on-one -on -one training when there are some challenges on the unit that nursing staff could not uh, complete that education and orientation. We do a lot of material development that is um, outward facing on the on the internet. There's a lot of brochures. Um, quite frequently, you will find them on your units that are hanging on the walls. So it could be anything like talking about MRSA, VRE, SBL, CPE, C. diff, influenza. And those are the brochures that are handed out to patients and the families when there is questions. But there is also that additional um, training that or education that is asked from us when there is more questions and it becomes a little bit more complex and time consuming for the frontline nursing to commit to spend so much time and they also feel more comfortable having us in um, to, to deliver some of this messaging. Uh, in the past, I would do I'll, quite frequently, I would get called to do the education, but um, I also had nurses joining me in so they can hear what am I actually sharing with the family so they also can use that information in future. So if you can do that, that's ideal because when we are teaching our frontline nursing, we are teaching them different uh, and sharing different information than what we are sharing with our um families and patients and not because um, there is different information it's just it's geared towards the different audience so it's not always applicable from what we teach our frontline staff to share that with with the families and often it's different terminology different lingo that we are using when we are educating frontline um, frontline staff versus visitors. One of the most critical pieces is, of course, sharing the, the how to clean your hands, how to don and doff PPE, but also is important. And every time you call any of the facilities, you will hear, please do not come if you're sick or if you're experiencing these symptoms. So just like we are teaching our frontline staff not to come to work sick, we are educating the visitors as well not to visit when they're having any, any sorts of symptoms of communicable diseases.
Yeah, so you're right, Anika. I think th with when you're looking in COVID, COVID has done a lot of things for better or for worse and has um, identified the gaps that we have had in the past and some things have resurfaced that we wouldn't necessarily go to at this point in time because it's some of these things were just not on radar or were too cumbersome to deal with. And when it came to COVID, it became very quickly evident that we can't have staff coming in with, with any sorts of symptoms because it wipes out complete units or it does have absolutely devastating outcomes for our uh, for our patients but there of course everyone was scared because when I think it's important to to recognize the perception of influenza versus COVID right so those would be your most common occurrences in healthcare staff that usually people would have some sort of respiratory illness or diarrhea and they come to work and not share that with us because Either they will not get paid or they will get scrutinized by their colleagues for taking that day off. With COVID, it was it's it we know if you come in, you will get everyone else sick. And some of our patients, some of our residents will not make it through. So where it's somewhat similar with influenza. If you come in with flu, you will get people sick. But I think the perception and the, the death mortality rate that is assigned and attributed to these two diseases makes a difference. So it's that, again, that risk perception. How do you see what is risk versus for you versus for me? So I think that's where you see the difference because the impact and and the media attention, of course, to COVID and everything that we ended up dealing with shaped that decision. When you say industry staff, what do, who are you referring to, Vernette? Um, no, other, st other staff like factory workers and other staff, oh. they won't report. So, and it, so there is there is that again understanding of what what is going on and recognizing. So in healthcare, we are fine tuned to to recognize those early symptoms, and you will find like as you say, like industry. I think you are referring to people that work in manufacturing, or um, like we have seen a number of outbreaks going on in um, these services like UPS and and Amazon and what have you. So it's, again, it's a lot of that comes from fi being fine-tuned and recognizing that there is something wrong and thinking I can fight this off, where with healthcare staff, with healthcare workers, we know that to recognize those early symptoms and act upon it. So to risk assessment, this would be a nice, nice segue into this uh, discussion about the risk assessment. Um, I think it is somewhat intrinsic to us to a point, but at sometimes I find with our staff, with the frontline staff, I find everyone is very um, brave at times and thinking it's not going to happen to me or the the risk becomes a part of day-to-day -day work and it's no longer seen as such. So when you think about risk assessment, I teach it as road crossing. So when you're crossing the road in the morning, when you're coming to work, you stop to see if there is a truck coming your way. However, when you enter that healthcare facility that you're working at, and you're looking at your patient, often you're not seeing that truck coming at you because it becomes a second nature to your day-to-day -day work. So what we have to be aware of is looking at your patient, looking at the activity that you're going to be performing, your, your stop and think, what will happen if whatever I plan, whatever type of care I imagine to deliver doesn't necessarily go in a fashion that I anticipated. So sometimes you will go in and you want to just 
take a look at the vital signs machine and you think I may not necessarily need a gown and glove in this instance, but you may come closer to the patient because they're asking you to check something. And at this point, you start having a very close interaction with them. And if your patient was on contact or droplet precautions, you're putting yourself at risk. So that's how I, yes, thank you. Yeah, I, that's how I kind of, I always have these weird thoughts in my head that I'm trying to explain to, to people what is a true risk assessment and who is at risk. It's you and it's your patient. But if you start and stop before you act and observe the entire situation, you're getting yourself in and you prepare yourself. So in teachings, I was I would work with nursing groups and PSWs and we would be breaking down their sequences to identify where the risks are. So in particular, we use this for hand hygiene and change of PPE, recognizing it's I find it's easy to recite and people are able, of course, to memorize these steps and recite them back to us. The disconnect happens when you are practicing and suddenly you don't know anymore, was this an event that I should have either cleaned my hands or should have changed? So when we started breaking it down into a sequence, doesn't matter how complex or how simple the um, the process was, we were identifying where are these risk assessments. So um, I would use something that's called HACCP, and HACCP is commonly used in um, in your food industry. So you're, it's called a hazard analysis of your critical control points. So you can use the same methodology when you're breaking down your sequence of care. So what are your critical control points that could put your patient or yourself at risk? So And then what do we do to control these points where what are the measures is it hand hygiene is it use of ppe or are we looking into putting that patient into a negative pressure room so then when you break it down and you identify those um sequences and those critical control points you actually can address this ahead of time and becomes almost like um almost like um uh, a map for driving through the, the navigates through your through your day. So I know I have a critical control point at this place where I'm providing medication or I'm um, changing my patient or changing the dressing so you can apply the same rule. So yeah, PP for PPE, it's really hard to to work in it's first of all you're uncomfortable you're hot and there is only so much you can function so much time you can dedicate to function properly wearing it the next thing is it gets contaminated of course so you're going from one patient to the other you're carrying everything on that ppe so it, it's it's a all of these things that you observe, they they are a result of fear. So I've had I had um, colleagues put a plastic bag on their heads because they were afraid. We had colleagues break into the supply rooms to take PPE that was absolutely not meant for this type of care. Um, just because they're afraid and they think we are holding something back. So for example, when you're looking at um, dealing with Ebola, because um, Ebola patients tend to have a lot of body fluids coming out. They do, they're hemorrhagic fevers, they are bleeding. So there is an expectation and recommendation to wear a full Tyvek suit. So we have these Tyvek suits in storage for these particular purposes. In case we come across a hemorrhagic fever, we need to protect our staff. We don't have these these supplies in, in abundance because simply you don't need it, but you have to have enough to manage. So what would happen when COVID came about, a lot of 
direct suits suddenly appeared on our unit, or I had pay, uh, staff wrap themselves in saran wrap and come to work because they were absolutely petrified. And no matter what you do, it just it has to work itself through the time, and you have to be that cool, calm person approaching them in, in an utmost respectful manner and um, teaching and sharing your knowledge and then highlighting the risks of wearing something that actually, how do you take a saran wrap off yourself without exposing yourself? It's impossible. You you cannot. No matter what is on that saran wrap, once you start unwrapping that, that's flinging left, right, and center. Other things that we were having um, quite a challenge with was the the booty covers. So um, the, the 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 shoe covers that you will find commonly used in in the ORs. So with that, there comes a particular training on how to safely remove that by rolling it rather than flinging. So whatever is on that shoe bottom now, when you take it off and you fling that thing, it's flying in the air and landing on in your face. And those are the the, the risks that we are not prepared to to deal with. And sometimes you think, oh, we are going to teach them how to do A, B, and C, donning and doffing. And suddenly you're dealing with something that you don't know how to teach and how to manage this. Or double and triple gloving, where when we are teaching how to remove this, it is Re revolving around a single set of gloves in your regular day-to-day -day operations as frontline workers that we are dealing with your regular run-of-a-mill droplet contact precautions. Yeah, so anything that you shake off, it, you're just aggravating whatever is on, on that gown. So for most part, it's it's quite interesting, you know, when uh, somebody here, I think, uh, was talking about your um, exercise with, with pudding, where you used pudding on your unit to teach how to remove gloves in a safe fashion so that is not flinging everywhere. So you can use the same thing for the gown. So if you had your pudding on a gown and they're shaking that off, that's flying everywhere. And everybody's face so no one wants nothing of that of that gown in their face and it's important just as it's important to doff ppe in a safe fashion for ourselves to protect ourselves it goes also for our surroundings so very often we are close to our colleagues and when you start taking things off that are flying you're actually putting your colleagues at risk So hand hygiene, I think um, I made it quite clear. Uh, Mr. Samuel Weiss is, is my hero for so many reasons. And um, we always go back to hand hygiene. You will find no matter what we are dealing with in our uh, IPAC careers, you will always be going back to hand hygiene. And um, it is somewhat sad that we are still in, after so many years of dealing with issues that are traveling and organisms that are traveling on contaminated hands, that we are still revolving and going back to square one and teaching basic things. The reason for it is hygiene is very personal. So we are all taught and trained by our parents to clean our hands. So, uh, you know, I, my earliest memories of the hand hygiene would be my mother calling me for the dinner table and saying, did you clean your hands? Or, of course, when you're going to washroom. And that becomes a part of, of our regular behavior. Um, when you're coming into your house, you're cleaning your hands. What becomes really a problem again is that, first of all, we always think of ourselves as, of course, I'm clean. Doesn't matter what whoever says to you, you always think, of course, I'm clean. I just did it. I came onto the unit, I cleaned my hands. I came into the facility, I cleaned my hands. And um, 
the problem is in, in the way we communicate. So if you see someone didn't clean their hands and you approach them and they say, of course I clean my hands, that becomes a little bit of that could be a conflicting discussion. So if you are the one that's been approached, then I know I've been asked to clean my hands. And in, in the role that we do, we rarely touch patients. We don't provide any health care. However, I find every time I'm entering a unit, I clean my hands. Every time I touch something at the nursing station, I will clean my hands. And it's not necessarily because I think the things are dirty or that I'm bringing dirty things, but it's also to set example. So people are always looking at us. I don't know if you guys find the same, but every time I'm walking down the hallway and all I can see is I trigger a series of hand hygiene just by, just by walking down the hallway. People see you, they start cleaning their hands. And that's great, but that's not when they need to clean their hands. So you can end up with, with problems where you have hand hygiene that is occurring at events that are not calling for hand hygiene. And then because people are thinking, oh, I clean my hands so much, they actually do not clean their hands when necessary. So every time you're teaching hand hygiene, try to reinforce that contact with either patient or patient environment. And so some hospitals have um, agreed to um, use the threshold as a triggering for the hand hygiene. So you would have at the entrance into the room, you would have a hand sanitizer and at the exit out of the room. So at least that way you are triggering the thought of I am leaving this space or I'm entering the space, therefore I need to clean my hands. That is perfect in an environment where is a private room. However, if you have a ward or a semi room, it becomes a little bit more difficult to create this imaginary spaces. So when we are teaching, we always revolve around your curtain space. So the curtain space defines your patient environment. Often in small spaces, in small rooms, of course, it's, everything leaks beyond that curtain space and it's your fine commodes that belong to your patient at the other patient's bedside. And you probably want to address that and actually make sure there is no sharing of that personal equipment. So for teaching, how do we trigger that hand hygiene? The best practices and recommendations are to have alcohol-based hand rub accessible at point of care. So as many beds in the room, so many sanitizers should be in the room. That said, I had my personal dealings with the fire department that finds this to be quite risky. And um, they are concerned with fire hazards that come from the alcohol-based hand rub in, in volumes. There is also um, a table that you can look at from uh, Just Clean Your Hands program from Public Health Ontario that actually gives you very clear guidance around how much volume per room. Uh, it is 1.2 meters minimum between your larger dispensers, those wall mounted 500 mils that you have to have between them. So if you're going down the corridor and you're putting them at every door, you have to make sure that you're having 1.2 meters between um, the dispensers. And then once you have a storage where you're keeping this, that comes of course, that's a much larger volume and your fire department likes to take a look at that and call you out on that one as well. Um, a, a little story here. My my small, my eldest grandson, who is um, nine now, um, before COVID, I used to have to always tell him, you know, go wash your hands, go wash your hands. So during COVID, he start walking with his small little hand sanitizer everywhere he goes. <laughs> that is so cute. <laughs> okay, Bernard, we need a picture 
of that child with a sanitizer. That is absolutely amazing. So yeah, it's um, it's it's interesting how this all trickles into into the the the, the world of children observing us what we are doing. Someone posted a video of this little girl, and she's going everywhere. Whatever there is sticking out of the wall, she thinks it's a sanitizer. She's putting her little hands to clean. It's absolutely adorable. Those are those are the the, the kings and queens of future for sure. Definitely someone I worship. <laughs> So when we start looking into our hand hygiene program, we should probably be hiring these um, the youth that is pushing for hand hygiene. Um, but uh, what is important for us to know, it is a bit of a challenge um, bringing product in the facilities at this point we had a massive shortage over the past year and we saw all type of product entering our facilities and our regular suppliers were not able to keep up with demand and it was real real challenge if we are to observe a program and start a program outside of covid um scenery and and influenced by covid it is a rather um, a complex approach to what we need to do. So you want to have involved different disciplines in, in to support you through it. So when you start installing your dispensers, of course, you have to have maintenance. You have to have housekeeping, responsibilities around refilling uh, empty dispensers. Who is responsible to um, refill these dispensers? And then also, making sure we do provide the education to everyone across the facility with regards to when to clean hands, what is the program itself, and before you start working on any of that, you have to have support from your senior leadership. The good thing is that is we are mandated to report the numbers and of course because of the statistics that we are mandated to report out, the, the program itself does have quite a lot of support. There, I've seen some amazingly successful programs and some that are there just to say they're there and no one really pays attention. But there is a lot of science that goes behind the hand hygiene programs. So who are your people that you would be using as your, so to say, your sidekicks, your partners in crime to help you um, create, establish, and propel your program and make sure it is strong and maintained throughout and from now on. It's something that if you don't maintain, it will die off, sadly. So for all our healthcare facilities, we, we are mandated to have them. Um, when you start looking into the hygiene program, there is the hand hygiene piece, but there is also the hand care piece that comes with, that's where you would partner up with your occupational health and look at the the skin integrity of the staff. So a lot of times people think, oh, the sanitizers are so harsh because they have alcohol in them, they're stripping my skin and they're opting out to clean their hands with soap and water. Soap and water is fine, it has its purpose, we've been using it forever. However, the problem with a, with the soap and water is accessibility. We often don't have hand hygiene sinks everywhere we need them. So it's easier to install a sanitizer versus putting a sink and soap and paper towels. So that's one aspect of the challenge with soap and water. The other problem is that when we are using soap and water, and if we were to clean our hands every time we need it, uh, first, it's time consuming. The other part is soap and water will actually strip your skin of your natural oils that you have in your skin, and that's what's causing breakdown. Also, the uh, paper towels that are around are quite 
quite harsh. They're not the, the best soft towels that we have. They, that action of tugging on the skin also breaks down the, the skin. The other part is accessibility of moisturizer. So you always want to have a good moisturizer next to your sink. Uh, usually the uh, your suppliers that provide you with soaps and sanitizers, they carry a line of moisturizers as well. And what's really important is that they do talk to each other. So they're chemically uh, equalized, so they're not canceling each other out. And then the other important thing also that does happen is the use of antimicrobial soaps, antibacterial soaps. So those are designed to actually remove the uh, your transient flora. So they will remove and strip down one's skin completely. So if you are using those, you will find that staff that does use these uh, antibacterial soaps, they have more challenges with the skin integrity. So those are some of the things to, to focus on. I will also say that with COVID, we had all sorts of product come in that stinky, sticky, gunky, and just not functioning. And it, that's anytime you have something that has uh, a bad smell or leaves a residue or um, is, is stinging the skin, staff is not going to use it. No one wants, you don't want to use, I don't want to use any of that stuff that I uh, clean my hands and then next thing I touch a paper, it's super glued to my hand. No one wants that. It's cumbersome. It's uncomfortable, right? So when you start looking into uh, choosing your product, it's always a good idea to um, actually have a team and do various trials with regards to the type of product you would like to bring into your facility. There is only so many that do serve into healthcare and they cater to healthcare. So you will not end up with 55 different products. You will un end up with probably maybe four, five different products. So some of the manufacturers have gel and foam. And then you will find that um, you want to do the blind study. So you want to put these out at the entrance and send out the questionnaires. But you also want to make sure that they do have um, single use or single package pro products that your staff can take home if they need to uh, maintain integrity of their skin. When you're doing uh, product picking, of course, you need support from your senior leadership, you need support from Arc Health, and then also you want to be able to process the information and pro um, provide that information back to your frontline staff. Sometimes people have this idea that they like certain products just because the advertisement has been much stronger in certain manufacturers and you will find them to be broadly available in, even when you're going out to your grocery stores versus the ones that are targeting predominantly your healthcare facilities and servicing and, and providing product into the healthcare facilities. Also, you want support from them, somebody who will be able to come and um, train your your frontline staff with you or um, help you and assist with that and do their own road shows. So I've I actually have tapped into those resources in past. They do come out with um, their little um, single use or single, uh, the individual packaging, smaller packaging. They bring uh, lotions. They also bring your um, barrier creams with them. So for, for staff that does have issues with skin, after work, they can use the barrier creams and sleep over with them, and that seals the moisture in. A couple other things to think when you're uh, talking hand hygiene and if you're doing any sort of campaign is also thinking about hands as, as tools, right? So this is something that, yes, it is attached, of course, to, to our 
to ourselves and our colleagues. But what happens when you go home? Are you gardening? Are you using harsh chemicals for some of the hobbies? And then encourage also glove use. And when I say glove use, I think the, 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 the winter gloves, mittens and gloves. So in some of the campaigns that uh, I've been using, educating frontline staff you go out to and buy you can buy them in dollar store i've been buying them in dollar store the little mittens and little gloves that they can just put in their in their jackets when they're leaving because frequently people forget to have them available so that's something to to also think about when you are teaching the hand hygiene so it's not just what happens when they're working what actually happens when they go home right so and that also shows that you care about them beyond the the hours that they're spending in in our facilities um so really anything you you do is to preset the um kind of front piece of your hand hygiene program. And then after that, you can start looking into auditing and enabling, um, looking at whether you have created an environment that the staff has access to sanitizers, has access to soap and water. They are equipped with knowledge to when and how, and now you can start auditing and looking at your numbers. So, I don't know how many of you are doing audits yourself, but um, I'm just gonna ask you, what do you think is um, acceptable or um, a norm for hand hygiene in terms of percentage? What, what is your take on it? What do you think would be in ideal world um, that you would want to see every of your units achieve X amount of observations? Oh, can you repeat that, Cornelia? So I was asking um, when you are looking into your targets for your hand hygiene, what do you think, where would you like to see your facility or your units sit at? What would be the ideal number for you? Uh, sorry, I, I meant to say a reasonable number. <laughs> no, I'd like to see that, honestly. Um, I strive for that every time I'm doing audits. So, and what is it you actually see? Um, about 95. Oh, okay. Right, so um, in the studies that have been completed um, on across a variety of facilities before you implement any of the the measures so you you always want to start with audit right so you want to establish your baseline before you do any of it you go out and just do audit see what happens based on your four moments of hand hygiene and look at the numbers in most cases it's about 40 percent compliance <laughs> yep so um i know it's it's quite staggering and as much as we would say we want to be at 100 percent, it's uh, it's unrealistic and the reason for it is that um there is events that we observe that simply cannot permit the hand hygiene. So um, if you have um, a patient or a resident that's falling, you don't stop and clean your hands and say, hold on, hold on, don't fall right now. I need, I need 15 seconds to clean my hands. So usually you will, sometimes you will see that. There is also situations where there is a life and death event where people are running in to save a patient. And that's usually when you don't observe for multiple reasons. You don't want to create more stress for them while they're saving life. The other thing, they will not appreciate you and it will be you will not be the, the best person they want to see next time, their favorite person anyway. 
but also it's just not the moment to observe. So you want to position yourself that you're observing events that are um, some, somewhat routine and that gives them an opportunity. So some people will tell me, you know, uh, I don't like to tell them I'm doing the audits. I just want to surprise them and so on and so forth. The, the thing is with, with anything in life, we either know how and we either know when or we don't. So it doesn't matter if you're observing me. Yes, I can be more nervous if you're observing me, but the knowledge is not just going to magically appear in my head because you're watching what I'm doing. So I may actually, in fact, miss the opportunities because I'm, I'm concerned or may not perform them right, or I may clean my hands more, but not at the right moment. If I don't know when is the right moment, I don't know. You just you watching me, it's not going to change that knowledge. It would be nice, but it doesn't work that way. So once you have established your baseline and you know, so say your your entire facility is 45%. You broke it down by the units or the wings and what have you, and you see that there is some, some discrepancies there. And then you do your, your spiel, you do your education, you make sure that the sanitizers are available, that they do like the product, they, they're not bothered by either the smell or there is no skin breakdown as a result of that product. So you, you observe and ensure that everything is in right condition. And then you can start looking at, again, at your auditing numbers and see what, where are the gaps. So I know with COVID, a lot of um, long-term care and retirement homes are mandated to produce a certain number of these uh, observations in a day or in a, in a week, and there is expectation to push these numbers out. The problem is not the numbers. It's what we do with the numbers. So once you identify that you either are coming down from the set rate or you're going up or you're not achieving set rate, is what you do with this, right? So it's it's auditing is a perpetual bliss, really. So you're constantly doing audits, identifying the problems, addressing the problems, and going back to audit. So if you're just collecting the numbers to say to whoever is asking you for these numbers and say, if you go to Quality Ontario and you look at the hand hygiene rates across the board, everybody is at 80 or 90%. When you actually observe people on the unit, you know very well that we are not at 80%. We are not at 90% because you see that there is missed opportunities. There is, and then when you are observing your auditor, your you can also do uh, what is gold standard from the IPAC. So if I was to have teams that are doing auditing for me, I do the auditing of my auditors just to make sure that um, we are all on the same page and that we know how to observe because that is also necessary to when you do these programs that are kind of train the trainer type of program so that some of that knowledge does get deviated as the time progresses. So you always want to go back and give an opportunity to your auditors to um, reach or maintain where you want them to be. So that said, Absolutely. Yeah, you're right. Two different people can produce different numbers. And there is reasons for it because it's physical positioning where you are when you're observing a person is a simple explanation for that. So I may not caught around the corner what you saw. And for me, I just didn't see it. However, what's really important is not making an assumption. So the way our brains work is we fill in blanks and there is nothing deviant or mean about it. It's just the way we are wired, we fill in blanks. So if I didn't see something, I would make an assumption that things are either done or not done, depending on uh, what are we observing. 
So quite frequently, if I see a person walking out of the room and they're rubbing their hands, I'm making an assumption that they clean their hands. They could be just rubbing their hands <laughs> truly without actually a sanitizer there. So what you don't see, you don't document. So that's as simple as that goes, and that's okay. If you didn't see something, you always want to remain objective in your observations. So if there was a moment that called for the hand hygiene, and you were just not there to see it, you don't document, we don't make assumptions. You always want to be objective and true. And that's what give you gonna, what's gonna give you the right numbers, but it's also gonna reveal if you have a problem somewhere and you always ha can have a conversation with, with your observed party. You can ask them, oh, I just wanted to check, did you actually manage to clean your hands? What has happened? What did I see? I missed to see, did you clean your hands? And they will tell you, oh, but I cleaned it behind the curtain or I missed it. And it's not something you document, it's just a document for you to have these conversations and normalize auditing and normalize um, that you are observing people. When you start um, auditing, before we hit the floor, there is always an expectation we train the auditors. However, something we forget is to train and share information with the frontline staff in with regards to how to receive feedback. So often you will find that your auditors are coming back and saying, I can't do this, people are mean to me, they're yelling at me. So we have to normalize that we are observing for a sake of improving the process and not for a sake of to identify that someone is doing something wrong and penalize that behavior. Because if you look at your rates and you are sitting at 40% compliance, it can't be that you have so many bad apples on the unit. There is something wrong with the process that we have in place and we need to get to the bottom of it. Oh, yeah, I got door shut on me. I had people telling me I'm annoying and all sorts of things. It's okay, we have to grow thicker skin. But it's also important that what we do, we communicate and importance of findings and what is that from the findings that we have done. So if you're collecting the numbers and you don't have a follow-up saying, you know what, I notice every time, every time somebody walks into this room, 307 for example, there is no hand hygiene. So you make a stop and take a look what's going on. So sometimes you will find it's, it's a malfunctioning dispenser or if you have an automated dispenser, the batteries are always glitching or there is something that is not encouraging that behavior. So it could be that is positioned behind the door or behind the curtain, they don't see it. And it's not something that triggers that, that desired behavior. So Take a look, and then when you're making changes, always involve your frontline staff. I have uh, handed out stickers to them and saying, where do you think would be most convenient for you when you're providing care? I can come around and put sanitizers where I think they should be sitting, but it's important for us to have these discussions because it could be that the nurses in this room are providing care on the left side of the bed because there may be an obstacle on the other side and vice versa. So you want them to have access at that point where they're doing the care so they can actually clean their hands properly. So um, one of the hospitals that I worked actually had automated um, observation system. So they're not ideal. They're far from uh, having a person observe. So they're basically what they're doing is the count, right? So every time someone pushes that sanitizer, it counts as hand hygiene. So people, for whatever reason, they would push a couple of times. So if you pump that sanitizer more than twice in, in a certain um, time span, it just annuls it. So it was becoming really interesting to see because sometimes these um, 
sanitizers, the dispensers are producing only so much foam or so much gel. So if someone likes or needs more when they pump twice, <laughs> it was not counting for them. And then also it's impossible to know whether that was in relation to any particular moment. So you just have really a number of, um, of the pumps. And so we assume by the location of the, uh, of the sanitizer and also knowing that um, how much time has been between the moments or the pumps that we can make an, uh, an assumption. But that's exactly what it is. It's an assumption. It's not ideal. It's not like having a person observing. Some hospitals have um, entertain the idea of installing cameras. However, that becomes a problem with the privacy as well. So you really can't see um, what happens behind the curtains. So you can only observe what happens down um, the hallways at the point of entry or exit from the room. It's something to think about, but definitely not as having a person following your staff and observing the hand hygiene in real time. There's nothing wrong with giving opinions for that. All right, so um, we are continuing in light of the hand hygiene. So it is alcohol-based hand rub is preferred choice over the soap and water. I think I made that clear in my previous um, discussion around this. It is every time when your hands are not visibly soiled. So if you're not having any organic matter on your hands, alcohol-based hand rub will work. And what happens if you have any organic matter, if you have, say, food or, or feces, the alcohol binds to the organic matter and actually doesn't remove or kill, rather, the microorganisms. The method behind it, the science behind it, is that alcohol penetrates penetrates into the microorganism and the drying action is actually what kind of explodes the microorganism. So you end up with um, a bunch of dead microorganisms on your hands. And um, I know a lot of people don't like the idea of walking around with microorganism corpses on their hands, but they're not viable anymore. When you're washing your hands with soap and water, you're washing away that organic matter that does um, have, of course, the contaminant, but also the microorganism. So that's where the difference is. And for some of these microorganisms, we will recommend soap and water over alcohol-based hand rub, and those would be uh, C. diff, uh, VRE and norovirus. So anything really that comes with feces, again, because of the risk of um, that contamination with feces itself, but also in in light of C. diff, C. diff is a, a spore-forming organism, and alcohol will kill the uh, viable microorganism, but will not penetrate through the spore. So you will end up walking around with spores thinking you have cleaned your hands. For the rooms where you don't have access to soap and water, uh, the recommendation is to clean your hands with alcohol and then walk to the next uh, first available sink. And it does become conflicting because in our teachings, we are highlighting importance of not going back and forth between using alcohol and soap and water because that does cause skin damage. But this is one of these uh, exceptions when we say, if you don't have sink in a bed, in a room where the bed is occupied by a patient with C. diff, clean your hands with alcohol-based hand rub, and your next stop would be sink with soap and water. So now we are going into our PPE, and um, it is a part of routine uh, 
practices and best practices, but it's also quite frequently linked to additional precautions. So when you see PPE, you often are triggered to think, oh, it's somebody's on, on uh, additional precautions. However, if you think about the risk assessment and ability to complete a risk assessment of potential sequence of care, it is often um, recommended and, and quite possible that you can teach and train the staff to do so, that they would be able to use PPE for routine practices. And um, so some of those things that's really quickly coming to mind would be changing somebody's brief and um, assisting your patients to the washroom. Usually that's when you see that staff would be wearing PPE as part of routine practices. Ideally, if we had perfect routine practices, we wouldn't need additional precautions. If we were in such good shape that we would say we are so comfortable in knowledge and expertise and follow through that our staff is able to identify the risks and follow through wearing and um, using proper PPE at these interactions that are putting our staff at risk, we wouldn't need additional precautions. Sadly, we are far, far away from that. So we do still have our additional precautions. And a good proof to you is um, the VRE that we've seen, um, the spike in bloodstream infections after the hospitals, um, some of these um, Ontario hospitals decided that um, to, to stop isolating for VRE. And in thought that, um, the, their frontline staff is competent and um, trained well to recognize and use PPE based on the risk assessment to remove that. It's actually proved that we are not in that in that place in time. That staff is actually adhering to proper use of PPE based on the risk assessment. So when you start looking into your PPE, often you will be involved and included in selection. So you may be uh, in your office one day and someone from the purchasing department will come in carrying an array of different P uh, gowns or gloves or visors and you have to weigh in. So when you start looking into this, there is resources to look at, CSA standard, does speak about uh, what are the minimums. Public Health Ontario does have some documents that also speak about the proper um, levels for appropriate procedures. So you would see that in by the newest standard, the minimum gown that we are recommending is AMI level two. And um, that's what you want to ensure. Sometimes you will find that from different manufacturers, all level twos are not necessarily feeling the same. However, if that's the label that they are carrying, you can go with that. Um, same thing with your gloves. So you will have your vinyl gloves, your plastic gloves, your um, the uh, what are the, uh, the the purple gloves that I'm trying to think of. the. So there is different use of the gloves that you find in day to day. Uh, so usually you would say uh, regular gloves that are being disposed are, uh, thank you, nitro gloves. Yes, that was the word I was looking for. <laughs> So for nitro gloves, usually you want to recommend them for your housekeeping staff because their hands are so often wet and exposed to harsh chemicals. And they also, you also want to recommend longer, um, longer gloves for them because again, they're stretching quite a lot, moving quite a bit, uh, reaching into different areas so that you want to ensure that the glove is covering that, um, that um, sleeve of the gown and it's not moving. 
So some of things to, to have in mind when you're looking at it. And then of course there is masks. So you're, with masks, you will also see there is different types of masks. So with COVID, I think everyone became an expert on, on masks nowadays, but the same thing you have level one, level two, level three, and it's actually um, with regards to permeability and where are they and how are they supposed to be used. Public Health Ontario has some really cool documents about that. I will upload that for you um, later so you can take a look if you need ever to assess that and access that rather. What's important when you start looking at into your PPE is how do we dispose of it. So um, you want to make sure you have uh, receptable receptacles accessible to the staff and that they can remove this in a safe fashion and dispose at the safe locations. With um, your reusable gowns, of course, you want to give them also recept receptacles, I can't speak, uh, where they can dispose of these used uh, reusable gowns and then they're going to go back to be reprocessed. Most cases you will find that um, these gowns are being removed off the site and you have third party reprocessing who is laundering these. They don't only need to be laundered. We are not sterilizing any of these um, gowns that are used for your regular PPE usage. Oh, um, so yeah, so these um, these events do happen, Marina, where sometimes it's just um, they don't know, they don't see the, um, <laughs> it is, it's, I think it's more uncomfortable than it's actually a risk. So um, COVID luckily does not enter through the skin. However, the idea of someone coughing on your neck is um is quite unsettling. I can I can relate and understand why would you want to wash your neck with soap and water. I feel I'd go through the car wash myself. But um so gloves you will find gloves are probably the most controversial part of PPE that you encounter. People like to wear them all the time. You will see them in the hallways. You will see them anywhere you go. And it's important to recognize that um, once they're on the hands, they're a second skin. Um, so they are task specific in single use. So once you have touched whatever is that you wanted to touch, they have to be removed and hands need to be cleaned after that removal. You will often be involved with, again, with selection of the gloves and purchasing department will include either you or anybody from your team in selection. So there you will have, again, a number of different manufacturers and um, different types of gloves. So there is a minimum standard that's uh, set for us that we need to have, but also um, the, the higher the quality, the higher the price, the higher the cost. So everyone is trying to um, keep the cost at the minimum. So it's important when you're recommending to support your um, recommendation with the proper documentation, why are you recommending a certain type of glove or, or um, certain manufacturer? So quite often I will tell you that when we had the uh, change in manufacturing that would happen, they would, we, I actually had to deal with this myself we were signed up to a certain product and they come under a code and they changed the product. So the manufacturer changed the product. So it was no longer a level two, Amy level two gown that they were sending. The code was the same, but 
it was quite evident that's not a level two. It was ripping and falling apart. As soon as someone would put that gown on, if they moved, the uh, the suturing was falling apart. So we had to go back and take a look at what's going on with these particular gowns. And they just decided to use the same code, but change and shift without telling us that they changed the, um, the level of that gown under the code. So for us moving forward what we did we did a trial we brought a bunch of gowns and distributed them across the different units and had focus group to provide feedback to us in helping us selecting the gowns so again you will um, recommend the bare minimum and then the the per working with purchasing department you put these these product on the unit and see how does the staff feel and i had gowns that were quite liked by a lot of people but we had a selected group that ended up with allergic reactions so we had had nurses that were breaking out in rash wherever the the stitching was touching their skin so around the wrist and where the stitching is for the ties around that was touching the, um, the um, bare skin, that was a problem. So obviously you can bring something like that into the facility where you have significant number of people reacting to the, to the product. That said, there is also a product that we brought in and I was still having uh, individual, one individual with breaking out in, in hives every time she would put out the gown. So we worked with occupational health department purchasing department and we were buying different gown for her and it was stored on the unit her manager kept these gowns for her and so anytime she was working on the unit and she had her assignment she would just replace uh, the regular gowns in the in the PPE holder for her and she was using this so what it comes down is that we are uh, mandated to provide the PPE to our frontline staff that is keeping them safe. So if it means catering to one person at a time, then it, we have to do this as, as the um, employer. So sometimes we as IPA get involved with that as well. A little story here. Um, <laughs> I've seen I've seen um, caregivers like sanitizing their gloves, <laughs> and also um, I have a latex allergy. So one time I went to my dentist, and as soon as it start coming over me while I'm sitting there in the chair, I'm like, "Oh, what kind of gloves are you wearing?" And he's like, "Oh shit, Vernon, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry, I forgot." <laughs> So I was like, I could tell right away as soon as he started coming towards my my face area. I'm like, uh, 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 do, what kind of gloves are you wearing there, Dr. Cassanti? So <laughs> yeah. <he's> like, <laughs> so um, the sanitizing of the gloves is 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 a thing. Yes, I've seen that happen myself, and uh, it's definitely not something we are recommending, because again, the um the the way the alcohol sanitizer, alcohol based hand rub works, you need that heat and friction from the skin in order to penetrate the microorganism. You may achieve some of that um, wearing gloves just because our hands are warm in there, but it will break down the glove. The gloves are not meant to be sanitized. Um, we have been teaching for doffing, for Ebola, cleaning of the gloves using your wipes, uh, and that's to reduce the burden on the glove, not to reuse this glove. So it was just to re reduce the burden and the risk of contaminating yourself through the doffing process. And all of this was for, the, um, particularly for Ebola, PPE, none of that was going into your regular garbage. It was always going to be um, biohazardous and destroyed. So the, the buckets and uh, the uh, receptacles for this 
uh, Ebola contaminated PPE was to be uh, incinerated. So it doesn't go into a regular garbage where the rest of our PPE just goes in, so into landfill. So that said, we don't clean with the gloves ever. And you raise a point, there's a lot of people who are allergic to latex, so we have to make sure we accommodate um, the, the, the staff with allergies as well. So when you are using your gloves, you always want to make sure that we are cleaning our hands prior to reaching into that box because that's another good exercise. If you guys want to try and see, uh, you can use either that UV light and powder or the gel, or you can use something like paint. So when you're reaching into the, the glove box, if your hands are not clean, you're actually contaminating the rest of the box. So something to also drive home as a message, but also when you take the gloves off, you always want to make sure you're cleaning your hands because the procedure of removing the glove can also contaminate your hands. We never wash or reuse the gloves. Gloves are single task, single use, and once we are done, we check them. That's how the, um, the gloves work. So as we go through the slides, I actually have included links for you to take a look at the, the recommendations from Public Health Ontario. Yes, glove to glove, skin to skin. I have no gloves in my in, in here to show you, but uh, it's recommended is to pull up at this area. So you bend your hand this way and then pull and roll in and then remove the glove. And then you end up with a glove in a with use glove that is now facing outside. So whatever was touching your skin is facing outside and you scrunch it in the other hand. And then you either, again, pinch the same area. Some people go under whichever way you want and then pull out again. So whatever was touching your skin is facing outside. And that way you're reducing again the risk for anyone getting exposed by accidentally touching and predominantly we're talking about our housekeeping staff when they're collecting um, the, the garbage from the rooms. So with, with regards to your gowns, you always want to make sure you're providing long sleeved gowns with a good cuff. So if they have a good cuff, they will not run up. So you want to make sure those um, gloves are coming over the cuff as well, but the cuff itself has to be fairly stable and stuck to stick to, to the wrist. You want to make sure that they are um, able to protect the staff wearing it, but they are not, often they're not water resistant, they're water repellent. So when you are, if you are testing it, for example, you can run it under the water and you should see some beading on the surface. But if you run it long enough, you will see that water will penetrate through these gowns. So they're not supposed to be water resistant. So level three are water resistant. Level Level twos are water repellent. So that's where the difference is. And often you will see that staff is bringing you these gowns. Look, it's wet. I've been running it under water. Yes, the intention is not for you to go take a bath in this, in this gown. It's only to protect you from accidental splashes when you are providing care to your patients. So you also want to make sure that gowns are removed as well once you're done providing care. So you're not wearing the same gown from patient to patient because they are contaminated and the intent is to protect you, but also to protect your patients. Um, so it's again, single task. I know with COVID things have been a little bit different and you see gowns that are moving around and it's a little bit hard to um, enforce some of these um, recommendations from, from Public Health Ontario when you start looking at it simply due to shortage of PPE and when the recommendations are coming out, there is, we have been involved even with um, some of these changes in recommendations, finding the safest way to reuse or continue using gowns um, through 
through some of the services. Usually you will find this in uh, in your screening facilities or if you have any sort of mobile facilities where we are um, swabbing patients or, or staff, so they tend not to replace the gowns in between. So that's something to keep in mind. But in normal world, before uh, before COVID hit, we were asking people to remove the gowns and uh, put a fresh gown as they're moving to the next next patient. Yeah, so there is some um, facilities I've seen using tongs when they're handing out masks as well. Really, um, that kind of works to a point, but if you are in a in in a setting where you have a number of people walking in to use the gloves, uh, so we are the ones kind of serving ourselves. It's no point of using using tongues, not uh, the tongues rather not tongues. Goodness gracious! Um, but um, you want to make sure you clean your hands and not use tongues. Um, so when we start looking. <laughs> And start looking into masks. There is different masks that are available in on the market, so you can see level one, level two, and level three masks. So usually we would provide level one masks to our patients during the transport, or we also use level one masks for um, in case of MRSA, for example. Level two masks are the ones that we use for droplet contact precautions. They often will come with a visor and the most common ones that we have been seeing for extended period of time before COVID hit that the mask that came with the visor, they were level three masks. And level three masks are used for surgical procedures. Uh, so they do have the resistance of splashing and protecting um, the penetration of splashes under high pressure, like arterial blood splashes and so on and so forth. So those are the level three masks. For droplet contact precautions, you don't need level three. Level two will suffice. However, because they, these level three masks came with um, a face shield that was a part of the mask, a lot of hospitals have opted out to use that. And they're quite convenient, really. So less cumbersome to, to wear these um, masks than putting a separate visor. When we started reusing the visors, this was not possible to use the same mask because you want to um, be able to remove your mask and um, we were recommending some cleaning of the visors through, throughout the day as the supply was uh, coming back up and we were having more access, we have decided to um, recommend again disposal of the, the visors as well as the masks. So it just things have been changing with the um, supply and demand and accessibility for us. For us in Canada, most of our supplies were either coming from the states or from China. Some of the um, some of the supplies were coming from Germany as well, and they're the only ones actually that kind of kept steady supplying the the numbers that we were ordering from them. But once COVID hit and everything stopped in terms of supplies coming from China, it, it became quite evident that we were struggling with with the supply of the PPE. So when you guys talk about these um, PPE that's being handed out, are you talking about um, at the entrance to the facility? Yeah, so when I speak about gloves and, and mask, I'm talking predominantly at the point of care. So what do you have in front of the patient's rooms and how are we as as uh, frontline staff using and accessing this. The other thing is, yes, the earlobes were falling apart. Everything was falling apart. A lot of these, um, the masks that were coming in, they were either not the right size, they were too small, they're not providing enough coverage, or and the, the, the ear loops were falling apart, or sometimes some of these supplies were also pulled out of the pandemic supply. 
and although pandemic supply does have a longer shelf life, you would see that with N95s in particular, the elastic was breaking apart. The mask itself, the respirator itself was fine, but the uh, the rubber pieces that do go around the head, they're the ones that were kind of breaking down because it was just getting to either they were exposed to moisture or whatever are the contributing factors that um, do cause the breakdown. So back to our masks. So you want to make sure again that you're wearing a mask whenever you are putting yourself at somebody's coughing droplets or sneezing droplets and the masks always come in combination with your eye protection and it's based on your chain of transmission so if we do know that we are going to be exposed potentially to droplets and we don't know what a person could have or not have but that's your risk assessment so you are putting um, protection to keep your portals of entry safe and protected from um, the, um, the, the, the um, secretions from your patient. So um, doubling on any uh, PPE comes with a risk because what happens when you have two, two layers of two masks or N95 and um, a mask, it, it, because it gets so hot and we do talk and breathe, um, you get these masks that become wet or moist if you want. So um, any piece of PPE, in particular masks that are wet, are no longer serving the purpose. So what happens when you start wearing double and triple layers of PPE, you actually are causing more problems to um, the break, it starts a breakdown of, of your PPE. And also it's really challenging to breathe wearing so many levels of layers rather of PPE. Uh, so level one mask is what we would be, as I said, giving to um, to our patients wearing that. So if you are transporting a patient, usually that's where we give them level one mask. But we as frontline staff are always wearing a minimum level two. Yeah, it was uh, with 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 this extended w wearing of masks in particular. There's a lot of damage that was happening around the ears, and it's uncomfortable. You're constantly wearing a uh, whole day long. You're wearing these masks that are just pulling on your ears. So people were coming up with um, different solutions. Some of them were crossing and then that would create a gap at the side. Other things were these stretchers that were used. So sometimes I would find it was too tight or too loose. So, um, you know, it's a lot of things that we were becoming very creative to, <laughs> to uh, be safe and use the, um, the PP in proper fashion. Okay, let's move along. Uh, so next, so I don't know if you can see, but this is a mask that I was saying uh, is coming with a visor and we always have to make sure that we change the masks that become wet. So that goes back to your question about the, um, the, the, the number of PPE. So the level, it doesn't imply that your uh, three ply mask is necessarily a level three mask. So when you are determining the levels of a mask, there is a test that needs to be done and it's based on the permeability of the mask. So you can have uh, masks that have less or more layers, it's what is important is that under the pressure when you're pushing a liquid through that mask, it's actually protecting you. So it's not necessarily that your three ply mask is a level three mask. So I think that's one of those um, a sales gimmicks that you find when you go places like grocery stores or pharmacies where they're selling and they're advertising as, as a three ply mask. And 
when we tend just because we see the number three to think that's the higher level of protection. But you always want to see what is the, the actual level, not the plies. So we are not reusing the mask every time it's wet or damaged or contaminated. If you were lucky like Marina was that someone coughs straight in your face, you just remove that mask, go out and replace it, do it in a safe fashion. And when you're removing your mask, you always want to peel it off your face and lean towards your um, garbage bin where you're going to dispose of your um, a mask. So you're not touching that contaminated front that is likely contaminated. So when it comes to N95 respirators, we uh, have to make sure that all our staff is properly fit tested. Usually it's done by your occupational health. Some places will have external third party contractors come in to do the testing. There are some problems with them coming out to facilities. They didn't clean their machines and was putting people at more risk. So something to be aware of that there is um, a risk with that as well. However, um, the N95 respirator is something that you have to go through test checking and you're going minimum every two years or when there is any dental work. So if you had any molars taken out or if you had any implants put in, dental implants, or if you had gained or, or lost five kilograms. So the, um, my take on cloth masks, I think they do work as a level one mask in general population out in community. I would never recommend cloth masks being worn by any of my colleagues because they're not pro providing enough protection for us as frontline workers dealing with the amount of um, sputum and liquid that we are, that's not good enough. N95s work for your um, airborne um, microorganisms that we may be exposed to or aerosolizing procedures. And every time you put N95 on, you want to ensure that you have a seal. And I will say that this is not something that I our staff is doing on a regular basis to so do remind them. The way you want to complete, complete the seal test is making sure that the metal uh, goes above and over your uh, bridge of your nose. And then when you cover your mouth, you blow. And if when you do blow through, you should not have any air coming either under or to the side or fogging up if you're wearing glasses. So when you blow in, you shouldn't feel any any air come through. I don't know if you guys managed to hear, I was talking to my hand, but um, I hope you heard what I was saying. So cup and blow. Good, perfect. So, um, Whenever we need to wear a 95, so as I said, for any exposure and risk of exposure to any of the microorganisms that are transmitted via, via airborne routes, so chickenpox, measles, TB, and also for any other procedures that may not be linked to this particular diseases, but like bron bronchoscopies or sputum inductions, and also, interestingly enough, your autopsy examinations. When you put on your respirator, you always want to make sure that it is your fit. Also, COVID has put us through quite a lot. So we had to go frequently get retested as some of these respirators were not available or manufacturers stopped producing them. So they were producing alternatives to it. There is something that is called a standard fit. It's like fits everybody, fits nobody. I would be careful with those as well. We tend to stick with the proper fit testing and ensure people are wearing what's properly fit tested for them and making sure that when you get your um, 
proper fit, you always have your number available. Sometimes you will get a sticker that you can put at the back of your badge, or um, there is always some way of of um, carrying that number. I tend to write mine in a Sharpie at the back of my badge, so I can always look back to it if it's not given in, in any sort of printed sticky or something that you can adhere to your badge, but you have to know the number. And the same thing, when you are putting your N95, you're putting it on, pulling your um, straps at the back, and when you're removing them, you want to make sure you're again leaning again so it doesn't flick back on you and you're peeling off your face. So you have to make sure you're doing it in the right right sequence and right fashion so you're not, and never touch anything in front. So when it comes to your eye protection, there's two different ways we can achieve this. It's either goggles or safety glasses and face shields. So everyone has seen these around. Um, what is really critical to remind people is that if you're wearing prescription glasses, rather, they are not sufficient to protect you. So you have to wear over either a face shield or goggles. <laughs> When it gets to safe work practices is another part of um, our routine practices. So what does that mean for us? So it's not just wearing your PPE, but there is also some of those um, tools that we have accessible, like needle protection, sharps disposal, hand hygiene. So that's something that is um, your, your employer is mandated to provide you with a safe work environment, but we as staff, we are the ones who are responsible. We are following the safe work practices. So this is not something that we as IPAC are going around enforcing. Usually that comes under the Ministry of Labor. So you will see Ministry of Labor coming around and walking through the units, looking if you have uh, sharp disposals available. Are they wall mounted? Um, what height are they at? Because you don't want anything that's too high that your staff needs to reach and then create a risk of, uh, of injuries or something that is on the floor and can spell. So um, those are some of the things to think about. And it is our responsibility as frontline worker, we are all responsible to follow. The employer is responsible to provide a safe work environment. When it comes to the control of this environment, we are talking about um, your accommodation, providing private rooms, providing negative pressure rooms. Um, with COVID, we ran out of everything, including space. So, um, it is, we had to find alternatives on how to accommodate our patients in a safe fashion and finding ways to do so to maintain the rest of the patient population safe, but also looking at how do we manage um, staff that is safe as well. So Marina was talking about bringing in additional scrubbers and HEPA filters into the rooms that does work to a, to a certain extent as well. Um, closing the doors, somebody else mentioned, so we are closing the doors and the staff is wearing a 95. So that's some of the, the measures. So there is these that are preset documented recommendations and then there is a real world where we are facing multiple challenges and have to find a way how to work around and work with the frontline staff to find solutions. Uh, we have to make sure that the patient equipment is in good repair. So anything that has cracks or is damaged and is beyond cleaning, we have to make sure it's no longer circulating. So a couple of things that come to mind would be commodes or bed pans or beds or bed night, um, uh, night tables or bedside tables. Because of the use of harsh chemicals, you will find that we are removing those top layers or just because of moving things around, they get banged up. And once you have a crevice, you can't clean that. 
Other things to think about is also use of wood and particle board in healthcare. You should be staying away from that. If you are a part of design team, when the renovations are happening, always think about removing any of these surfaces that are really difficult to clean and would harbor microorganisms and are not compatible with your cleaning uh, or disinfecting chemicals that you are having in your hospital. And what is, I think, another, it's very similar to your hand hygiene program is working with your housekeeping. The, your housekeeping team has their own policies and they're independently functioning from IPAC, but we have to be very, very closely involved with them to be able to uh, educate them, train them. So the training of cleaning and disinfecting comes from their supervisors, but there is an aspect of IPAC that you want to make sure you touch base with them on that as well. And um, you work closely with them whenever there is an outbreak, whenever there is any clusters that you're dealing with, so you know that if something is going on on your unit that you have created capacity and build a capacity in that team that they're self-sufficient and able to support you through um, whatever we are going through in terms of outbreaks or clusters or increased incidence of new cases on your unit, whether it's a C. diff or VRE, whatever it is that you're looking at, there are there to support you. So back to our recommendation, as we said, single rooms are always the gold standard, whatever we are dealing with isolations, if possible, with dedicated bathroom and sink. In some older facilities, you don't have that and you can't whip it up overnight and just because you need it. So you find and work around. So it could be bringing commodes into the room or uh, talking to your frontline nursing and identifying whether a patient that is maybe sharing accommodation, which one of them should have access to the washroom and which one should have, uh, should be using commodes. So working out some of those um, questions that can contribute or help you control um, the, the transmission or breaking into an outbreak truly. It is a problem. We have established this. This is no no more uh, a secret. We don't have enough rooms in our facilities. We don't have enough private rooms. So we have to find a way to, to work around it. Uh, it is important that when these decisions are made, where the patients are going, we uh, provide our input and support staff if they have questions. If you're working enough, long enough with them and um, some of our experienced seasoned frontline nurses can make these decisions without us, but you always want to know where did your patient go. So sometimes they will move a patient off the unit to find the proper accommodation. That most frequently will happen if you're looking into a negative pressure room. Not all the facilities have negative pressure rooms on all the units. So sometimes you just have to move that patient, say, from a surgical unit into, into medicine floor that does have a negative pressure room. Or uh, sometimes you will find that if we don't have negative pressure rooms, we have to move a patient to a whole different facility to accommodate that. So your cleaning um, of environment is critical. As I said, it is absolutely important that we have good sound relationships with our with our housekeeping teams they are gonna make you or break you there is no question about it i will tell you that thanks to amazing housekeeping practices and amazing housekeeping staff we had brought outbreaks down in in amazing amount of time and there's times where we had um, either had new staff or experienced shortage of staff that has actually pushed us into outbreaks. So it is important that um, we work closely with them, we educate them, we train them. And also when they're purchasing cleaning products, we are part of that decision-making process because you want to make sure that we have a say in what is coming into our facilities. Are they bringing in 
a product that is going to take 10 minute contact time to clean C. diff, you know it's impossible to keep a surface wet for 10 minutes in a busy unit. So you want to be the one that person saying, oh, how about bringing something that has a shorter period of time that actually gives you a chance to fight that microorganism that does take time to kill. Other things is also involvement with policy development. So they will have their own policies, but take a look if you um, are a new hire, take a look at what their policies are so you are familiar with it. And also as they're going through updating their policies, you um, should be involved with reviewing their policies and putting in your, your thoughts and, and providing some advice to them as well. So that comes down to your housekeeping. Um, what is important to know when you are observing? So you as IPAC practitioner may be involved with auditing some of these procedures. Usually happens when we are experiencing an outbreak and recognizing the difference between what is hotel clean and what is hospital clean. So when um, your hotel clean is looking at the cleanliness and your visual appearance. So typical example of it is when you enter the facility and for the first time, I always think about the floors, the shiny floors and that main corridor is how much time people spend maintaining cleanliness and, and shine of the, the vestibules, the entrances. So that's that first impression one gets when they're entering the facility. From the IPAC perspective, we really don't care if the floor is shiny or if those windows have a nice sparkle. All I care is that the doorknobs are clean, the toilets are clean, the bedside tables are clean. That's where my focus is. And um, so we have to work with what is important as that first impression and how are we impressing anyone coming through the front door and working with the housekeeping. So your hospital clean always builds on top of your hotel clean. So your hotel clean would definitely mean, oh, are the garbage bins empty? So yes, we of course we want them to be empty, but if I was asked what do I want to clean today, I'm not asking can you bring that Zamboni machine to, to shine up the floor? Can we please make sure we clean the room of a C-diff positive patient today twice versus shining up the floor? So those are those are where we kind of find ourselves in in middle ground and finding what's important to others versus what's important to us. Oh, okay, so when we are talking about the um, cleaning of the surfaces, Sharon is bringing up a use of same rags. So um, the studies actually are showing that microfiber has supreme um, characteristics in cleaning. When you, are te when you are observing them, you have to see whether they've been through that um, training of proper folding. So when you're looking, depending on the size of the rag, they are supposed to fold it. So every time they're using the rag as they're going through a surface, they have to fold it. So when they're moving through the surface, the clean rag surface is touching your um, clean, the surface that they're cleaning. Um, there is that and then there's also the surface area that they can cover with one rag and has to be disposed. When they're moving through the cleaning, they always have to go from clean to dirty. So you're starting with the cleanest surface, moving towards the dirtiest surface and making sure you're replacing the rags. Um, with some of the diseases and some of the prescription coming and recommendations coming from Ministry of Health in particular, they're the ones who can actually dictate to us what to do. The recommendation was, especially when COVID came out, to use disposable wipes. So there is only so many manufacturing um, and suppliers that do have disposable 
wipes and you want to look at, so when you have the wipes that are at the point of care, they're usually smaller wipes versus the big buckets that your housekeeping use. So they're, I think they're 30 by 30 centimeters. And so they're also meant to be used for a certain square uh, area and then disposed of. So Can when we-, we break after this, please? Yes, absolutely. Let's finish this and have a five minute break. So your hospital clean, it is, um, as I said, cleaning of these high touch surfaces and something that is more of a visual appeal appeal when you are looking into your um, hospital clean, you build on hotel clean and then you add to it disinfection and increased frequency. So you're looking into your high touch surfaces and uh, cleaning of the non-critical medical equipment. The critical medical equipment goes for reprocessing, of course. And when you start looking into your sporocidal agents, there is uh, three most commonly used and depends on the facility to facility which one they land on. Uh, most common ones are your sodium hypochlorite bleach and your accelerated hydrogen peroxide or parasitic acid. Okay, so let's have a five minute break and then we can come back and continue chatting.
How do you take your coffee, Burnett? Um, it depends on the day. Sometimes just uh, black and sometimes with a little bit of cream. I don't use sugar at all, so. <laughs> oh, and that lobster. Oh, my gosh. I know. Sharon. I'm looking I'm at it. The thinking... lobster now. <laughs> You guys are making me hungry now. All right, so let's move to, do we have everyone back? Back, okay. So Renette is back, Jagdeep is back. Everyone's back. All right, so let's continue. So I'm gonna show you um, a picture here. So what are the high touch surfaces? I had somebody once tell me, um, <laughs> and it really made me laugh. And it's just, I think it's the understanding of what we are talking about. So this uh, particular person, when we were talking about high touch surfaces, she, she thought it's the surfaces that are high, high up in the room. So she was so confused. Why do we need to focus on cleaning the high touch surfaces when there, no one's going up there. So just to, <laughs> uh, so just to be clear, high touch surfaces are the surfaces that we touch frequently. So they're high touch surfaces. They're not high on a shelf or high in the room, uh, but what are they? So there are your bedside tables, your your switches, light switches, doorknobs, obviously uh, toilet seats and sinks in the in the bathroom, and anything really that we touch frequently through the day. So those are the ones that we need to focus on when we are. Uh, advising people what to clean in the facility. So if we are being stopped in a hallway and um, you have a housekeeper who tells you, we are understaffed today. Is there anything that you would like me to focus on? Or is there something that I can get away skipping today? So you definitely want to tell them not to skip on, on any of these surfaces. So they can focus on that and leave that shiny floor for some other day, that'd be amazing. I also would say every time if I can, if when I see housekeeping entering the, my office, I always tell them just to do the, the bare minimum because they have other things to take care of and I'm perfectly capable of wiping down my own, my own desk. All right, ladies are getting hungry here. Okay, so the other part that we may be a part of is your food preparation. Um, and quite frequently you will be asked, can we get disposable for, for the patients on precautions? So we do not recommend disposable dishes for most of the things because your food premises are actually inspected on a regular basis by your local health unit and by um, the nature of the population they're serving and the frequency of meals that are prepared, they're deemed as a high-risk facility um, and they're inspected under the Health Protection Promotion Act minimum three times a year. They, uh, your inspectors may pay more frequent visits if there is something that they have concerns with. But as far as IPAC involvement goes, we are really not looking into any of the food preparation. You may be asked to provide training with regards to PPE and um, support the teams as you're going through outbreaks on some of your units. So you may have some of those visits, but when it comes to the food premises, we are not involved with them at all. What is important, I think, for you to know is uh, in case of um, any foodborne illness, um, they are mandated also to keep food specimens on site. So something for you to know. But again, we are not involved with that. Linen, again, I think that's kind of one of those topics that people feel fairly strongly about, but um, it is usually done through either in, in larger facilities, you will find that we tend to hire a third party to process our linen, so they're taken in and brought back to us. 
and um, they're not we are not sterilizing linen for everyday use there is some uh, indications when we do for the surgical site uh, for the surgical program rather for the ors but for your regular patient rooms we are not sterilizing any of the linens um, the stripping of the linen predominantly falls under uh, on the discharge falls under your housekeeping team or discharge team, depending on how you're set up. And there is, of course, expectation from the frontline staff to replace linen from the nurses and PSWs when they're taking care of the patients that are still in the bed. Anything that is really being soiled, we want to make sure we are not shaking the same idea like we are not shaking the gowns. So you will just want to make sure you're containing uh, as much as possible so we are not shaking up that contaminant out of the, um, out of the, the linens. It's the way you manage them is the same way, what, how is your patient? If your patient is on additional precautions, and whatever type of precautions that patient is on, that's what you're wearing to manage dirty linen. Uh, once the room is cleaned, you don't, um, we are not wearing PPE in, in clean rooms and putting fresh linen on. Um, so that's pretty much it. I see there's some recipe exchange happening on the side here. Uh, all our linen are to be either into packed into the bags and one of the biggest complaints you will find is that we have um, overstuffed the bag so that comes from from the yeah, overfilled bags that comes from um, your housekeeping team or depends on who is removing this sometimes could be your portering team depends on on how your healthcare facility is set up and then also there is the shoot. So the shoots that we use to uh, deliver and send down the dirty um, linen, sometimes they get stuck. I also um, know somebody who was a prankster and was sending one of those, you know, those um, Santas that sing and dance. So they... <laughs> They were sending them down to shoot, so all you can hear is Santa singing as you're walking, <laughs> walking around is is singing down the shoot. So um, please do refrain from doing anything like this. It does create problems as much as it's fun. It's um, it's it's an issue for <laughs> for our housekeeping and portering teams to pull that thing out if it gets stuck. Yeah, people come up with ways to, to entertain themselves. So other part of uh, our routine practices is engineering control. So how are we handling sharps? Um, so you will find in most of the facilities, you have them mounted at the wall. At, usually it's at the head of the patient's bed. You don't want people who are administering, administering medication or uh, coming in to draw blood to walk around with the Sharpies and putting themselves at risk or putting someone else at risk. Usually with your lab staff, they will have these little containers on top of their carts and um, and um, the, the, being able to dispose of on, right there on the site. So during the outbreaks, um, I don't see any issues with whether we are using them during the outbreaks or not. There's a lot of concern that we are aerosolizing things in these shoots, but if everything is properly sealed, I would say, I wouldn't say send down um, the shoot linen or anything really or garbage that is um, after that we looked after Ebola patients or anyone with hemorrhagic fevers because you want to make sure that is properly uh, discarded. For the rest of it, there's really no instructions that we shouldn't be using that. So the uh, containers that we are using to dispose sharps, they actually have to be puncture resistant. So there is most of the facilities that are, I can think of, I can't imagine um, facilities not having a contract. There is a contracted, um, usually uh, like a subcontract or consultants that come in, take out some of that um, 
they, you may end up with the same contractor doing your linen and taking away your sharps and uh, um, looking after your garbage. Depends on what's the setup, um, but it can be also that you have different different contractors taking care of different things. But for most part, your sharps are taken care of by a subcontractor. So there is I only know of really two that are quite common around. So it's one or the other and also the education of the staff for this falls under occupational health it's not necessarily something that ipac does but it's good for you to know what uh, type of training occupational health is providing to the frontline staff so that's safety and how do we manage so your physical barriers is something that is in place and usually they're either curtains or you have some kind of room dividers. These room dividers are usually hard, kind of like accordion folding type of div dividers on the wheels. They're easy to wipe down and you can bring them down in cases where you have to utilize spaces that are not commonly used. So we've been using them to create additional ER space in some of the clinics that have ceased to operate through COVID. So they're really cool for that. That said, um, nurses really don't like them because they're, they tend to trip over the wheels, but there is no alternative sometimes that you can't come up really quickly because you have to go back to that space. And if you start installing tracks and putting curtains, then when uh, that space goes back to the original owners and back to the original purpose, it becomes a challenge to, to use that space. And then of course we mentioned this glass and plexiglass screens, and that's usually for your frontline staff that is working at the nursing stations. Within the um, within the inpatient units, this is not a common occurrence. The only places where I've seen enclosed nursing stations is the mental health departments. Outside of mental health department, I've never seen use of glass or plexiglass dividers to separate the nursing station from the rest of the unit. And of course, the sneeze guards are commonly used in your um, in the food premises, whenever you are in a cafeteria or um, if you have any sort of buffet serving stations, they are equipped with, with sneeze guards. It's not that I'm a big fan of any of the buffet food, but anyway, it's not about what I'm a fan about, of, right? And then your administrative controls, that comes down to your more of that soft approach to, so now we have the room, the dividers, we have the sharps disposal, we have everything in place. So this is your soft approach to um, addressing some of these um, parts of your routine practices. So that includes staff education and training, education of your patients, teaching respiratory etiquette. So sneezing in the uh, in the elbow, almost said in the eyeball. I don't know what I was thinking. Uh, health workplace policies, immunizations, and then so that falls into includes staff and patient immunization. So for most of the patient immunization, it does it is mostly focused on long term stay patients and residents. So you will find that. In uh, long-term care, long care settings and retirement home, we are talking more about patient immunization. In acute care settings, we will have some of these discussions in um, your alternative level of care or continuing complex care, or if you are uh, have a dialysis program in your in your facility. So that's when we talk more about the patient immunization. From anything else, the patients do not stay long enough for us to implement immunization programs, and that's the reason why. So for the staff immunization, again, we are not necessarily um, implementing or enforcing any of these. However, it is important for us to know what are the expectations. Sometimes we do support occupational health on some of these uh, 
large campaigns, especially if they're doing influenza immunization campaigns. So we go out and huddle with them and provide support from that end, but we are not the ones responsible for um, enforcing and providing immunization to the staff. Usually with regards to immunization, you're uh, asked to provide either proof of immunization or proof of immunity. And uh, if we don't have any record such, uh, usually they will ask us to either do uh, the blood work to do serology to provide for them. The, the proof of immunization. So that includes your annual influenza vaccine, your measles, mumps, rubella, your varicella, hepatitis B vaccine is a big, big um, ask. And also what is important for you to know for purpose also of your quiz and test for uh, CIC to really get comfortable with your hepatitis B and be aware that some of your staff will never mount immunity to hepatitis B. No matter how many times you vaccinate them, they simply never respond. And being aware that that particular individual may not necessarily be um, performing duties that put them at risk uh, to, of acquiring hepatitis B. So if um, that happens, and you have somebody who does work in operating rooms, you have to be involved with that piece because what goes one way goes the other way as well. So if um, a staff is exposed, that staff also may be exposing the um, the patient. So just be aware that those are there. That's a possibility that you may have an individual who. Uh, is not mounting resp uh, response or immunity after immunization. So something to keep in mind. Uh, so then your meningococcal vaccines. So that's usually what we would see as being quite rec frequently recommended for the lab staff because they are managing and handling the cultures. And of course, your tetanus and diphtheria. So that's your every 10 years is uh, we are due to get our tetanus and diphtheria uh, vaccine. So check your yellow cards and see if you got immunized properly. So when we, now we are going into our additional precautions. Your additional precautions are always built on top of your routine practices. So everything that we covered so far, now you come to additional precautions and elements of additional precautions include your cohorting, uh, additional precautions and training of visitors. Also part of it is the prompt initiation of the uh, additional precautions and responsibilities around who has the ability and can in initiate precautions and the answer is everybody and who can discontinue it's only us nobody can discontinue precautions it's except ipac team uh, often it is also your infectious diseases physicians that can do that depending on their role in my experience they tend not to get involved with that they will uh, usually let you know that if they're no longer suspecting an infectious disease and they have an alternative diagnosis, they will let you know and you come around and discontinue precautions based on their findings. But the, we are the only ones who can discontinue precautions. In some cases, I remember during the weekend in one of the hospitals I used to work, we would provide the conditional list to the shift managers. And if the patients have met the said criteria, they were able to discontinue precautions, but it would have also to be quite clear that there is no new symptoms or new findings. So we would say, for example, ESBL patients that were on precautions for having catheters in, if that catheter comes out, the shift managers were given instructions to discontinue precautions. Or for example, for patients with diarrhea, if they're approaching 48 hours of being diarrhea free and they had their formed stools, 
they could come off so off precautions without consulting us so there are some ways to work around this but predominantly the responsibility sits with IPAC team and then also what are we looking at of course you guys know it's contact droplet and airborne and then the combination of these um, precautions can be put in together when we are either ruling out something or if we know that certain diseases have ability to survive on surfaces so we'll get a little bit into that as well so what is, what is part of additional precautions again the accommodation the critical piece that we spoke again and again use of personal protective equipment dedicating equipment whenever possible when that's not possible we have to stress the importance of making sure that any equipment that is leaving a room from a patient on additional precaution that must be cleaned and disinfected that is ideally done on as a part of routine practices however it does happen that sometimes equipment just walks out without cleaning and this is where you stress this importance uh, limited transportation we try not to move our patients around when they're on additional precautions in some instances we would say especially during the outbreaks we will say absolutely no movement of the unit they can only go to a higher level of care so they could go to ICU or if they need surgery or if diagnostic imaging cannot be done at the bedside like CT or MRIs or um, with, with some of these x-rays you can only see one view and they would like to see um, better view of the x-ray so we would have that uh, in that case, absolutely yes. However, we then have to make sure that patient is transported on precautions. The receiving unit or receiving department is fully aware of the status of a patient and they know. So sometimes if you're moving a patient from facility to facility, you want to pick that up phone and say, hey, you know what? We are sending a patient that is, I don't know, having TB, and so that is a transfer of accountability from nurse to nurse, but also could be something that you as IPAC want to give another IPAC practitioner heads up. Most welcome is when this happens with measles and um, these uh, diseases that do have a high uh, transmittability. What is important is that this is your communication piece. This could be done also by flagging the patient. You may also have a way of adding additional um, markings on the patient chart. So you can have something on the front of the chart so your receiving department can spot that immediately. There is different ways people come up with communication. Um, you could also be having something like um sometimes i find people put gowns on top of the patient not to having a patient wear a gown but just put a gown on top so it's not something that is easily uh, identified by people who are just passing by however it is a yellow <laughs> gown that is on top of a patient and your receiving department can easily identify that so it can be a completely different mode of communication from one facility to the other but that's some of the examples I think we have discussed cohorting to quite uh, a great detail yesterday and today, and it is something that is possible to do. However, when we are cohorting, we have to make sure we are putting likes with likes. We are not putting anyone else at risk through the cohorting procedure. So you wouldn't put your uh, suspect patient with a negative, with a no negative patient. You wouldn't put your known positive with a known negative or definitely you would be separating your exposures from the known positive cases other uh, way of looking at cohorting is also staff cohorting so with when you start looking into your <clears throat> staff cohorting you can look at um, <clears throat> 
quite commonly use that during the outbreaks. So you would have, once you have ability to split your unit into either uh, known positives and known negatives or known positives and exposures or known positives and exposures and known negatives, you can accommodate uh, staff. Also becomes a little bit challenging when you do that with assignments. So when you are moving through your outbreak, you end up one part is heavier than the other. But um, it is something that we do stick through and do ask for cohorting of staff. And also you can look at, um, sometimes we create completely separate units during the outbreaks. Other thing when you also opt out for cohorting is when your outbreak is going on for so long and um, the affected unit has such a low number of patients that remain and you have now say a unit of 36 beds and you are left with eight patients from the outbreak, you can start a fresh admit but you have to have a very clear physical barrier separating your um, existing outbreak and then your fresh admits. You definitely want to have separate staff, separate supplies brought to them, so there is no crossing of of the patient and uh, sorry staff and supplies. But also break rooms are critical when you're looking into cohorting. So if you have a unit that is experiencing an outbreak, you don't want those staff members mingling and, and hanging out with with the um, with the pay, with the other staff from the other units that are not part of an outbreak. So when we start looking into these um, precautions being initiated, I think. Uh, this is something that we have to make sure it's very, very clear uh, that based on your symptoms, anyone who observes the new onset of symptoms can initiate precautions. How is this being communicated to us? It becomes um, quite different from a facility to facility. Uh, sometimes they will just give you a call and say, oh, hi, Jack Deep, you know what? Uh, Leonard in room 318 has developed now fever. I'm starting him up on droplet contact precautions. I have entered into system and uh, we will be separating Leonard from uh, his roommate, Vernet. So Vernet is, going to be also isolated until we rule out what is happening with Leonard and also we will be monitoring Vernet for the signs and symptoms. So the other things that also we have to keep in mind is that the initiation of precautions is not just our responsibility. And sometimes I find we beat ourselves up if things are missed, but keep in mind there is other people that are aware of the onset of symptoms before we are. Um, they also can, there is different, depending on the system that your facility is using, some of the more elegant and sophisticated systems can actually pick up on documentation. So if the staff documents fever, you can get triggers in your emails or on the chart, you will get like a little uh, exclamation mark or a flag um, also, what is um, a part of this uh, system, you will find that if a nurse is entering diarrhea, it will not let that nurse continue documenting until they respond to um, precautions to be initiated on the screen. So it is another safety system in place that um, will remind people to isolate the patients. 
And then once they initiate on their end, you may either get, as I said, either a text message or an email, depending on what type of system we have and how elegant are these documentation systems that are available to us. Sometimes it is just a good old phone call and saying, hey, you know what? Now we're not had fever too, not just Leonard. So we are continuing with isolating them both. Yes, depending on how these systems are set up, you will have different modes of, of triggers for the frontline staff to ensure that we are promptly isolating patients. Uh, sometimes it, you will get a call at 10 o'clock at night and they're saying, you know what? We have so many people on, on, that are symptomatic. We don't have anywhere to put them. We are doing the bedside isolation. Is there something that you can help us or help us stratify who is more important to move around? So you will have sometimes a full assessment over the phone of a number of patients where you're giving them directions in terms of who you can potentially cohort and who you shouldn't cohort and who takes the priority in moving patients around. Also, us as IPAC, we do have a lot of reach. So in some of these cases, when you see the unit is really struggling, I would call down the bed allocation and bed flow and say, you know what, can we help them? They're really struggling up there. Can you find some spaces off the unit? Because usually your units are perfectly capable to find space within their own within their own space. Sometimes they will be working closely with their sister units. If they have two or three medicine floors in your facility, they are able to, to find location for their patients. Sometimes that's not a case and we do help and assist with that. It is not our, it's not an expectation from us, but if you can help, it does make a big difference for them. So contact precautions, we know that there's either direct contact or indirect contact, and it's quite commonly um, common organisms that are transmitted through contact precautions. We touched that yesterday, MRSA, VRE, CPE, <clears throat> uh, C. diff, so those are your contact transmissions, and you can have something like touching your patient directly or using equipment that's contaminated and transporting organism in that fashion. So with your contact precautions, you always want to make sure you have a sign up. Um, it is in addition to routine practices. And a couple of things that we have to keep in mind as IPAC when we are uh, putting measures in place and educating frontline staff is the way these organisms do travel. So is it contamination of hands? Is it contamination of equipment? And also looking at um, the, the, the clinical presentation of your patient. So is it uh, MRSA or is it say um, a C. diff. So what type of um, cleaning are we asking also for? So when you can, you can think about uh, with C. diff, you would definitely want to use that um, sporocidal agent versus MRSA that does not require. So we'll find that some hospitals to simplify and streamline the confusion around, they decided to just go with sporocidal 100% through and through. There is no alternative. They're always, always using sporocidal. So I already answered this question, what microorganisms are transmitted through the contact route? So we are moving into, into our um, droplet contact precautions. This picture just made me think of Marina, how she got that lovely sneeze on her neck. Um, but this is quite common actually that we are exposed through the droplet. So it could be obviously your sneezing and coughing, but also could be just um, regular conversation with another person. Uh, Droplets will carry microorganisms, of course, uh, and usually you will find that coughing and sneezing tend to spray further than just regular chat. 
So what microorganisms are known to be transmitted through your um, droplet route? Anyone? Any organism? COVID? Flu? Yes? Anything else? Tell us, please. <laughs> I want to uh, actually pull up something for you guys. Um, Have you ever, let me see if I can share my screen here. Where are we? Um, okay. Let's share this one. Have you seen these uh, linear cards in past? I like to give them out to um, <laughs> I like to give them out to frontline staff, so it kind of helps them making their decisions in terms of what type of precautions you would um, need for a certain kind of organism. So you can see here um, the green is droplet, red is contact, but also. Um, if you see that where is overlapping, that means it's droplet contact, right? So, yeah. So if you ha can get access, you can either print them and have them laminated. It's a, it's a pretty cool cool tool to have. Uh, Public Health Ontario used to hand them out, and there were kind of cool cards that you could just like badges on that hard plastic and wipeable, but um, I haven't seen them being handed out in a really long time. So Jagdeep, if you are interested, um, I'm gonna share a link here with you guys. Yeah, I can share that there as well. Uh, so you can access that for when you need to, if you want to print it. All right. So, yeah, I like them. I really, anything you can get, give a nurse besides a pen, they're quite excited. They're easy to please with gifts. So the airborne transmission, of course, you guys know that is only few diseases that are listed as true airborne transmission. Having said that, there is the um, activities that we perform that can aerosolize and make your regularly uh, droplet contact transmission because you're pushing either too much air or um, you're creating these aerosols that end up carrying organisms on these um, on aerosolized um, droplets. If you are to compare and explain the difference to um, your frontline staff between the droplets and contact, I actually use analogy of um, shower and dust. So if you are ever in an in environment like a barn or any um, space where you have a lot of dust and the sunlight is coming through the doors and you can see those particles of dust floating on the air. That's how I would describe the uh, airborne and aerosolized particles. So they're uh, so light that they're suspended in the air and they're unfortunately not something that we can see with the naked eye. However, they will remain, because they're so light, they will remain in the air where your droplets are like 
a shower. So when you step into the shower and that water is hitting you or like rain, so they're heavy and they will not remain suspended in the air. So they will hit the surfaces and remain there until they dry or until you clean them, where that would be how I describe the difference between aer aerosol and, and droplet. I don't know if you if that makes sense to you, but that's how I do that. So here is your references. They are at the end of each. That looks so strange. I don't know what just happened there. Um, but uh, the references are at the end of the um, the slides that um, I swear they don't look like that on my presentation. So I don't know if it's something that I'm zooming in, but if you need them, I can uh, upload that as well. So we come to the end of week five as well. And I will ask you if you have any questions or is there something that you were hoping I would cover and I didn't, and we can have a brief review. Vernet is like, I'm done, I have my coffee, now I'm gonna go and make some food to eat. Yes, absolutely. That's absolutely correct. All right. So I'm just um, then going to tell you guys I'll see you through the week in our discussion. And we'll meet next Friday again. It's going to be just Friday, no Saturday. So we can plan to have some fun next Saturday and not listen to me talk iPad. Yay, party, Canada Day weekend. All right, take care, guys. Talk to you later.